Okay. So if you remember, I gave you a handout that first day on Monday, and it had um, some descriptions of orientation as well as terminology. So I was hoping that maybe you did that. But this is a picture from your um, chapter one in your textbook. And this will be very helpful when you start to uh, study the bones and also when we start talking about the muscles, which is next quarter, and also actually the blood vessels and the nerves. So for example, when we talk about the axillary region, the axillary region is in your armpit. So instead of, of armpit, we say axillary. And there's lots of blood vessels, but there's also nerves that run through that area. And there's also lymph nodes. So the axillary lymph nodes that you get swollen when you get sick would be in that region. So I would recommend looking at this and um, I might also print out a copy of it because it'll be helpful when we start talking about the bones because you'll notice here that femoral, right? That's the femur. Patellar, that would be the kneecap, right? Um, when we look at the uh, fibula, right? We have the fibula and we also have the, tap or the um, uh, tibia, right? And then one of the things that we talked about or was on your handout was the calcaneus. So there's actually a calcaneus bone right there, which would be the heel bone. And so this will be of use, um, just learning this, this terminology. So I'm not going to directly test you over it this quarter, but um, I just would suggest that it's just gonna make things a lot easier when you start to move into um, memorizing the bones and the other structures in the body. Okay, we also talked about orientation. And one of the things that I put on there was cavities. And so we do have body cavities um, where organs sit. And so one of the things that we'll talk about is how the skeletal system actually helps to protect different parts of the body. So if you look at the dorsal body cavity, so that's the back of the body, right? That would also be what? Dorsal also would be what? Was another term that you could use in lieu of dorsal? Would it be remember? Posterior, right? So the posterior would include the vertebral cavity, which contains the spinal cord. And so between in our we have vertebral, or excuse me, vertebral foramen, which are holes that the spinal cord travels down. And then obviously the skull is or houses the um, brain and it is important protection for this really soft um, uh, structure generally it's really soft when we preserve it and you look at brains preserved they tend to be um, much firmer um, and that's just because of the preservative it's more like um, tofu or oatmeal in its consistent consistency so this is the thoracic cavity and so it is protected by the rib cage and it is separated from the abdominal cavity by a structure here called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is really important in respiration because it is what contracts and relaxes and causes inhalation and exhalation. So you'll notice that the thoracic cavity can be divided into different parts. And this middle cavity has a name and it is called the mediastinum. And so when we start talking about the heart, the heart is located in the mediastinum. So it is located in the central. So when media, I think kind of middle. And so you'll notice that the heart actually, this, this cavity, the structure actually connects to the diaphragm. Then the lateral um, structures here, these are the pleural cavities. So when you think pleura, you should think lungs. So sometimes people get pleuritis, pleuritis or pleuritis or pleurisy where you have inflammation of the covering of the lungs. Okay. And then we have superior mediastinum, and superior means above. So the mediastinum is inferior to the superior region of it. Okay. So this is the abdominal cavity, and um, it is also protected partially by the ribs, but also by your pelvic girdle. And so this is what happens what uh, houses all the digestive structures. So your esophagus actually travels from the back of your throat all the way down and then it pierces the diaphragm 
and then it connects to the stomach and the stomach would be in the abdominal cavity. And then the pelvic cavity specifically is that which is protected by um, deep into the, by the uh, pelvic girdle. And that contains reproductive structures, but also your bladder and the rectum, okay? And so this would be the ventral or anterior body cavity. So um, might want to look at that. This is still chapter one in your book. Okay, so I'm gonna review the levels of organization. So when we talk about um, biology, um, we can break it down into small pieces and then we can kind of build up on the levels of organization. So at the most fundamental, we are composed of atoms. So atoms are um, structures, atomic structures that make up elements. So we also can say that these are elements. And does anybody remember what the element that is makes up the backbone um, or the main structure of organic molecules is? What is the element? Carbon, excellent. So we have carbon, for example. So remember we talked about how carbon is important in creating um, rings, but also chains of molecules and carbon makes the basis for proteins and um, phospholipids and lipids and nucleic acids, as well as carbohydrates, okay. So then we have molecules. And so molecules are where carbon, or not carbon, but um, atoms come together. So for example, we could have this molecule. And so what is that? Salt, right? So sodium and chloride can come together to make salt. And salt is a really important um, um, in our bodies because we need the sodium and the chloride um, for proper um, cell function. We can also look at molecules like glucose, right? So glucose is an example of a carbohydrate. It's a simple sugar, and it is what our cells use to produce energy. So the next level of organization would be the cells. And this is actually where we first start to see um, the characteristics of life that we talked about on Monday. So cells are able to reproduce. They're able to use energy to maintain their order. They're capable of homeostasis. They're capable of, um, of uh, digestion as well as they get rid of waste products. Okay, so we would sometimes say in biology that cells are the fundamental unit of life. So when we look at cells, we can look at, and we're gonna talk about this today, individual cells. And so whenever you see that site ending, that means that it is a cell. So C CYT means a cell. And so what do you think osteo means? bone, right? And so this is a cell, a mature bone cell. So this would be an example of a very specialized cell that resides in our bone and that is alive. So one of the really interesting things about our, about our body is, is that we are composed of living cells and even our skeleton is alive, okay? Then we have tissues and this is actually where we're going today. And so this is in chapter four of your book, we're gonna talk about tissues. So we're gonna skip over the um, chemistry and the cell biology because that is something that we now cover in um, the previous, the prerequisite for this. And so tissues are groups of cells with a similar structure and function. So a good example of a tissue might be smooth muscle. Okay. So I also gave you on Monday a worksheet to do about tissues. And so where might you find smooth muscle? 
In where? Yes, so in the intestine, because it causes peristalsis. And where else? Ureters, you said, that would be bladder, has smooth muscle. So does the uterus. And so do blood vessels. I think I mentioned that before. So blood vessels would also be where smooth muscle um, resides. Now, sometimes people get confused between tissues and organs because organs are groups of tissues. That make up a structure. So some organs that you might be familiar with would be like the stomach. Right? That is an organ. And that's pretty like basic. That's kind of you can understand that. But also blood vessels. So each blood vessel in your body is an organ. Okay? Bones. So bones are not just make up, made up of um, bone um, tissue, right? But our bones are actually bone, but they also have connective tissue, and they actually have blood vessels and nerves that go into them and supply the cells with nutrients and also can stimulate cell division, for example, so your bones can grow when you are an adolescent. So bones are actually considered organs. And also muscle. So for example, if we talk about a muscle like the biceps, brachii, right? So the biceps muscle would be an example of an organ. It doesn't just contain skeletal muscle, but it has a connective tissue sheath and nerves innervate it and blood supply takes oxygen and nutrients to the, bustle, to the muscle. So that would be an example of an organ. Okay. Then we can talk about systems. So systems are groups of organs that have a common function or not maybe not a common function, but a common role. So these are groups of organisms, or organs, sorry, organs, with a common role. So digestive, oops, digestive, circulatory, reproductive, urinary, right? So the digestive system doesn't just consist of the stomach, but it also actually consists of the small intestine and the large intestine. And then we have digestive glands. So for example, we have the liver and the um, pancreas are part of the digestive system. And so what is the main organ, say for example, in the urinary system? Well, the bladder stores the urine, but what actually produces the urine? Kidney, right? So we have the kidney, and then we have the ureters that drain the urine to the bladder, and then the bladder stores the urine, and then it comes out through a structure called the urethra. So all of those would be separate organs that work in the system, okay? So oftentimes we teach these systems as being um, separate from one another, but there is, um, a interest in starting to combine the systems. And so, um, for example, when you're, this is a big problem in medicine. So when you become an old person and you start to have health issues, sometimes you have these specialists that are like the gastroenterologist, um, right? So he can, he looks at your digestive system. And then you have the gynecologist, if you're a female, which looks at your reproductive system. And then you might go to a cardiologist, which looks at your heart. And so sometimes it's really weird, but they, that when you start going to all of these specialists, sometimes they actually don't communicate very well with one another. And so sometimes if they're giving you lots of drugs, you'll have drug interactions. So you might have your heart doctor might be giving you something that's affecting your digestive system, right? And then your, your digestive doctor is giving you something else which might affect your blood pressure, right? And so there is a push to start to bring the systems together, to integrate them, right? 
So for example, we could have a person that is not just a neurologist, but maybe a neuroendocrinologist. Oops, endocrinologist. So this is just an example of how we might combine that. So we have the nervous system, and what else are they looking at? The endocrine glands, which produce what? Hormones. So they're not just looking at your nerves, but they're also looking at how hormones might affect. And the obviously, the nervous system and the endocrine glands are directly related because, for example, in your brain, you have your hypothalamus. And it actually specifically talks to your master control gland called the pituitary gland. And so we know that the nervous system and the endocrine system are really interlinked. And if something goes wrong in one part or if something changes in one part, it's going to affect the other. So putting that back together is probably um, the, um, the kind of the big push as we go into the next part of the um, medical um, profession. Obviously, becoming a specialist, you probably make more money than becoming just a generalist. <laughs> but it's really important to think of these systems as interrelated. Okay, so then we have the individual. Okay, so how do I know if I'm looking at an organism, what the individual is? So if we're not looking at just humans, like we went to a foreign planet and you were like, what is the organism? What is the individual? This is the individual generally is defined as capable of reproducing itself. So if you're looking at a bacteria, you can look at bacteria that are individual organisms, right? So this is the organism that is capable of reproduction. So our systems are very specialized and they have to all work together and the individual cells have to all work together in order to allow just a few cells to potentially be passed on to the next generation, right? So we are this multicellular organism and we've recently just discovered that there's actually more microorganisms on and around our, in, in our body than actually human cells. So there's more microbes than human cells in your body. And um, they are all aiding, well, if they're good bacteria, for example, they're all aiding the individual um, to potentially reproduce, right? It's helping us, us to survive from a um, biological perspective. Okay, so in your book, there is a diagram that shows these levels of organization. This is sometimes called the biological hierarchy, right? So this is the biological hierarchy. And again, we are really good at looking at breaking it down into small pieces, but we're much more, um, it's much more um, challenging for us to look at the whole system. Okay, so I mentioned homeostasis, and what else did I call it? Same state, but then what else? Did you write something else next to homeostasis? Dynamic equilibrium. Okay. So the reason why we are really interested in homeostasis is because when we get imbalances, and in your book they have this H, and then they have a circle around it, and then we, they put a, like a line through it like that. And this is what is called a homeostatic imbalance. And this is what tends to cause diseases. Okay. So you can think of um, regulating a proper blood sugar level, right, would be an example of homeostasis. And if your blood sugar levels are not regulated, it can cause you to um, have seizures. It can also cause you to lose con consciousness, and it can cause organ damage, and it can cause you to die, right? 
So an example of this would be diabetes, right? Would be an example of a homeostatic, homeostatic imbalance. So what we can learn when things go bad, right, is we can learn how we would normally function. So we want to learn about healthy homeostasis, but oftentimes in order to study that, it's kind of, it's, it's good to look at when things go wrong. So when you take, you know, medical classes, um, you're going to, and oftentimes you're going to think you have everything, right? So you're going to Google it and you're like, oh, I'm sure I have that, right? I'm sure I have this. I'm sure I have that. You have to realize that our bodies are really quite amazing, the things that they do. And in general, we are quite healthy overall, right? So you don't want to like focus on the imbalances other than to learn about healthy homeostasis, right? The healthy dynamic equilibrium in the body. So when we talk about homeostasis, we talk about a set point. And this can sometimes be a range, right? So this is what we want to maintain. This is like, if we're talking about blood pressure, we want a set point, you know, we want our blood pressure to stay relatively constant. If we're talking about glucose levels in the blood, we want it to stay relatively constant, right? So the set point is generally given in a range. So, you know, healthy blood pressure is given, this is the low end and this is the high end, okay? So when we talk about um, the imbalance and the maintenance of the, set, of the set point, we need to talk about the stimulus. Okay. Now the stimulus can be internal. It's important to realize that we have internal receptors and external. So external is easy to think of like, we're in a hot, we're out in the desert, right? That would be an external stimulus that we have to respond to by perhaps conserving water and perhaps sweating to reduce our body temperature, okay? But we also have internal stimuli. So for example, we have the levels of glucose. We also have, um, looking at in the blood, we have um, a, uh, stimulus of like how concentrated is our blood? How many solutes is in our blood? What's the concentration of solutes in the blood? And that would be an internal stimuli. Also would be like the levels of hormones would be internal um, stimuli. So we can respond to both internal and external stimuli. So then we have the receptor, right? So this detects the stimuli. Then we have the control center. Okay. So the receptor sends the stimuli to the control center and this control center is what causes a response. Okay. So this um, detects or um, is where the stimuli is. is sent, sorry, I work on this. Stimuli is sent and processed as a response. Okay, so that's my control um, center. Okay. Next we have what is called the effector. So the effector is actually what causes the response. So the control center sends a message out to the effector that something needs to change in order to influence the stimulus that is being received, okay? So this is causes, this specifically causes the response. Okay, so that's my effector. Okay, so if we look at an example of this, one thing that we can look at is um, temperature regulation. 
So this is a diagram in your book that shows the balance. And so we could talk about body temperature, right? So body temperature in Celsius is about 37 degrees. So this would my, be my, my balance is my set point. The stimulus sends or is detected and, and the receptor sends a signal to the control center. So you'll notice that the receptor to the control center is called the afferent pathway. So you wanna write that down in your book. So receptor to control center is the afferent pathway. And that is distinguished from the efferent. And the way that I remember this is I always just think A is before E. Okay, so the receptor sends it to the control center. You could also think of this as being, let's see if I can erase that. I mess with that. I remember how to use my eraser. Okay, so this is, it says efferent, right? But you can think of it as being sent to the effector. So the efferent sends the information to the effector and that's a good way to remember that as well. Okay. Okay, so this is a diagram in your book that shows the two different mechanisms for maintaining um, body temperature, depending upon if the body temperature gets too high or if the body temperature gets too low. So the stimulus would be that the body temperature rises. So here the body temperature gets too high. There are receptors in the skin, but there's also receptors in your brain that tell me that or sense that the blood is becoming too warm. And we didn't talk about temperature as a necessary um, thing for life, but if temperatures get too high, then proteins start to unfold and become denatured and then chemical reactions will stop working. And so uh, being um, having hyperthermia, so we'll put hyperthermia here, tends to actually kill you faster than being hypothermic, okay? So we're actually kind of, it's a greater risk for overheating. So if we look at the, um, uh, the control center, does anybody know where in the brain do we have the control center for temperature? Does anybody know? This is actually the hypothalamus. The effectors would be the sweat glands, right? And sweat actually allows us to lose heat because the water absorbs energy from the surface of the skin and then it evaporate, evaporates. So we have evaporative cooling. And notice that that brings that back into a balance, okay? And then interestingly, we have the ability to also increase our body temperature and one of this has to do with shivering. So you could put on a coat, right? But when you get really cold, you start to shiver. And what this does is this takes chemical energy in the muscles, it says chemical energy, and it converts it to mechanical energy. And whenever we convert from one form of energy to another, we lose energy as heat, right? So shivering is just one of the things that our skeletal muscles do besides allowing movement, is this that when we shiver, we, we, we produce heat and that helps to regulate the body temperature. Okay. So the mechanism, this mechanism of homeostasis has a name and it is called a negative feedback. So the mechanism is called a negative feedback. Right? And so you don't want to think of negative as being bad, right? Negative is not good. And in fact, in this particular instance, it's really a good thing because what this means is, is that the response decreases the stimulus. Okay. 
okay? And this moves the body towards homeostasis. So negative feedback mechanisms are the primary mechanism by which we maintain homeostasis, okay? So if we look at the opposite of this, we could look at the positive feedback, right? And positive feedback would not maintain homeostasis. In fact, it kind of escalates whatever change is happening. So for example, um, if the um, response increases the stimulus and then the stimulus then sends a signal to the control center and it goes back out to the effector and it increases the stimulus even more, right? So this means that the response makes the stimulus greater. So it actually increases stimulus, okay? And this moves the body towards some conclusion right, so to some end. And so you can imagine that there's probably very few examples of positive feedback in our bodies. One example of this is labor. So this would be females giving birth, right? So um, when the contractions happen, um, that actually causes more hormones to be released, which cause the contractions to become greater. And so the contractions actually, the stimulus of contraction actually causes more contraction. And so you get this progressive buildup until the baby is born and then the contractions stop, right? But that would be a good example of a positive feedback. Obviously that doesn't occur in males, but here is one that occurs in both uh, females and males. And this would be an example of um, blood clotting. So another example is blood clotting. Okay. So the stimulus of blood clotting is, is that you receive a damage to the tissue. So you've damaged the blood vessel and the platelets start to um, come out of the blood, but they also start to actually adhere to the breakage point, right? And they kind of create a net. And the platelets adhere and release chemicals, and then those chemicals attract more platelets, and then you get progressive blood clotting until blood um, hemorrhaging ceases. So blood loss ceases would be where it, this is going. So what disease do you know of that might be um, due to um, homeostatic imbalance of blood clotting? What diseases? Heart. heart disease, right? So you get, um, uh, for example, um, I want to say, um, you get blood clots. So you can get blood clots forming in coronary arteries, right? Coronary means heart. And so that would be really bad because then you're gonna stop the blood flow and you're not gonna get oxygen to the heart muscle and so the heart muscle is gonna start to die, right? And if that happens a lot, then the heart will get progressively weaker and weaker and weaker and then you'll essentially um, have um, a heart disease that um, will be um, just continue to get worse. Another good example of this is in stroke, right? So you could have um, clotting in the coronary arteries, not coronary, in the, uh, what are these big ones? Not, that's the vein. Ah, uh, starts with the C. Carotid, thank you. Carotid arteries. So some people have um, blood clotting issues, and you might know of people like this, 
So when they're on an airplane, you see these annoying people that are kind of standing and they're walking and they're walking and they're like, sit down, right? You're driving me crazy. And the reason they're doing that is their doctor told them to do it. Because what happens when you sit too long is your blood starts to pool in your legs and then you start to get clots. And so then those clots can break free and they can go to anywhere. And oftentimes they go to the lungs and so they can cause damage to the lungs, right? So you have to think kindly of those people that are walking the aisles in the plane because it's probably because they were told that they needed to get up and walk every 40 minutes or something like that. There's also um, a new thing since I've been um, ill. Actually, it's not, actually this, they did this to me when I had a back surgery. But what do they do when you're in bed for a long period of time and they're worrying about blood clots in the legs? Yes, so they put this really weird machine on your legs, right? That causes contraction, right? And it puts pressure and then it relaxes. So it sounds like this, right? And it's like pressure on your legs and then it releases. And it's kind of annoying when you're trying to sleep, right? Because it's constantly just contracting and relaxing. And what that is doing is that is mimicking walking, right? That is keeping the blood flowing so that, um, so that clots do not happen. So blood clotting is, can be a real problem medically, right? But it generally works just fine, right? And if, you can't, if your blood doesn't clot, then you're really in trouble, right? Then you're a hemophilia, you have hemophilia, and you could have not only external bleeding, but you could have damage internally that could cause blood loss. Okay. okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to chapter four in your book. And I'm hoping that you will be able to get on Mastering a &P. So hopefully you'll be able to get on that. And let me know if you're not on it by Friday in, in lab so that we can, um, after lab, we can try to sit down and do it together. Because remember that you have your assignments, which are due Sunday night. And one of these is a little quiz on tissues. There's also um, a quiz on um, histology. So histology is actually the study of tissues. So you could take a whole class in histology and that's all you would do would be studying different types of tissues and what disease versus healthy tissues like, look like. And you might even actually be able to create slides of tissues by using a, a machine that cuts the tissues very, very thin. You can put them on a slide, you can add different dyes um, that adhere to different structures in the tissue, and then you can look at them underneath microscopes, right? So the study of tissue. So this is actually, there is an extra credit version of this, and I believe it's not due this week, but maybe next week, or maybe the week after, I can't remember, let's actually look. And so I would go ahead and do that. Okay, so it actually has a due date, which is not the end of the quarter. Okay, it is due January 28th. Okay. I made it extra credit because it's a little bit challenging, right? So I thought instead of making it for a grade, I would challenge you with your extra credit. But it is totally relevant to the stuff that you need to know anyway. So it would be helpful to do to study for the rest of it. So we have different types of tissues and there's actually four main categories. Okay, so these are epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. And this is the order in which I believe your book might talk about them, but also the, what, the order that we're going to talk about them. And in your um, chapter four, they have a picture that shows some of the locations of the different types of tissues. So obviously the nervous tissue is most abundant in the brain and the spinal cord, but also in the nerves. Nerves, interestingly, are organs as well. So they actually, nerves are not just nervous tissue. 
Then we have um, muscular tissue, right? But remember that muscles are actually organs. And then we show the epithelial tissue and then the different connective tissue like the bones, the cartilage, the tendons, and fat. Okay. So it's a nice little diagram that shows the different parts or the different kinds of tissues in the body. Oh. Okay, so before we start talking, oh, where's it going? Before we start talking about um, about uh, tissues, I want to go back to the idea of cell junctions. And so this is actually in chapter three of your book, and you might have studied it in cell biology or maybe not. And it's important to realize that when we talk about cells, cells are generally um, bathed in fluid. And so we have um, fluid between the cells, but also cells have to be connected to one another. And so there are different types of connections. So for example, tight junctions help to create barriers. So you'll notice here that they have proteins that interlock, and this would actually create a barrier. And so when we talk about tight junctions, a good example of a tight junction would be, um, for example, in your small intestine. So tight junctions. We have the epithelial tissue lining the small intestine. So the small intestine is where we absorb nutrients, right? And so we take in our food, and the food actually can have on it harmful microbes and yeast and fungi. So we're taking in a lot of microbes, in the, and potentially some of them could be harmful to our body. When we goes into the stomach, the stomach is very acidic, so it might kill off some of those microorganisms. But when it gets to the small intestine, there could still be microorganisms present. So there still could be bacteria. So we don't want the bacteria getting access to the blood and being able to move across the small intestine. And we also don't want other substances that are not that have not been broken down, right? So when we look at the small intestine, we say that the cells, or let's say nutrients, nutrients must move into the cell. Right, so into the cells. So you don't want them moving between the cells. So not between cells. And that's important because your intestine has receptors and it has specific channels. And so it only wants certain things to come through. Other things need to stay out, right? And so we have found that some diseases, some homeostatic imbalances, are due to the tight junctions in the small intestine not working. Can anybody think of one, a disease that is becoming much more prevalent that is uh, uh, where the small intestine doesn't work properly? Crohn's disease and also celiac disease. So celiac disease and Crohn's disease. So this means that things that normally should not get through, get through. And in the case of celiac disease, this is gluten, right? So gluten can get taken up by, you know, or into the blood, it moves directly into the blood as a protein. And then you have an allergic reaction to gluten, which might include um, rashes. Um, it might also include um, other bad feeling symptoms like uh, foggy brain and that kind of stuff, right? So it's an immune um, reaction. It's an allergic reaction to that. So sometimes they call these diseases, they have a kind of a term that some people use, which is called leaky gut, right? So you don't want a leaky gut. You want your gut to have good tight junctions, <laughs> okay? So if those tight junctions aren't working, then your gut becomes leaky. Okay, which means that stuff that gets that shouldn't get into your blood gets directly put into your blood. Okay. 
So tight junctions are really important. So if we look at the other one, um, these are called desmosomes. So this one is called a desmosome. And des desmosomes are um, important in all types of um, tissues. But if you think about the skin, you want the cells to be tightly anchored to each other, right? So you want these, these, there to be anchoring proteins. So cells are anchored. And can resist, um, what do I want to say? Tension. Right? So these anchoring proteins are really important. And in some people, I um, can't remember the disease, if it's called butterfly children, I think it might be called butterfly children, where they get sore. So even the lightest touch can cause their skin to rip and tear. And um, then they get infections and then it takes a long time for them to heal. So they're, even little things can cause the skin to become damaged and that is a really horrible disease to have. And people generally do not live very long with that if they have that disease. Okay. So this one is called a gap junction. And this is where we have protein channels between cells. So we are actually going to be studying the heart. And the heart muscle cells have gap junctions between them that allow ions, charged particles, to flow directly from one cell to another. So when you look at an EKG, an electrocardiogram, and you look at the uh, depolarization of the heart muscle, that is what you're looking at. You're looking at the movement of charged particles through the heart. And they move via gap junctions. So this would be um, in heart muscle, which is also called cardiac muscle, okay. heart muscle cells, example of that. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna start with epithelial tissues. And epi generally is means in root terminology, it means upon. And so this is, and then thelial means layer. So this means upon, and then we have layer. So epithelial tissue includes the outer epidermis. So the ep your skin consists of an epidermis, but then also the dermis. So this is the outer layer of the skin, the epidermis. So this is your skin. So that would be epithelial tissue. But epithelial tissue also lines organs. And it can have a variety of functions. So one of the things that we can talk about, so if we have functions, is it could be protective. So the outer epidermis protects the body. It creates a barrier between me and the outside world, right? So it prevents microorganisms from getting into my body. The lining of my mouth is also epithelial tissue, right? The lining of my lungs is also epithelial tissue. So anytime you have substances coming into contact, outside substances coming into contact with the internal body, it is first coming into contact with epithelial tissue. Okay. Epithelial tissue can also be used in absorption. Okay. So the lining of the small intestine would be epithelial tissue. Also functions in secretion because Epithelial tissue gives rise to glands, okay? So this would be glands. So for example, sweat glands are actually modified epithelial tissue 
that produces what we call sweat, which consists primarily of water, but also has some salts and also some protective immune function. The epithelial tissue can also um, be um, um, important in excretion. So this is getting rid of nitrogenous wastes. So um, we, can, we can actually get rid of nitrogenous waste by sweating it, but that's not the primary way that we get rid of it. We get rid of it in our kidneys. So the tubules in the kidneys are um, lined with epithelial tissue. The kidney tubules are, and they function in excretion. Okay, so those are some, uh, some functions. Now we can talk about descriptions. So we can talk about the number of cell layers. So they can either be simple, which means that there's a single layer of cell, versus stratified, which means that there is many layers of cells. Now, as you might have learned in cell biology, there is a one that is called pseudo-stratified. Right? So pseudo means false. So this means that this epithelial tissue looks like it consists of many layers of cells, but it doesn't. It's still a single layer of cell. Now, there is also really interestingly a example of what is called a transitional epithelial tissue. And transitional means that it goes from maybe being many layers, like six layers, to fewer layers. So this could be that means that it goes from like six layers to three layers. And interestingly, this allows the epithelial tissue to expand and then also to get small. And so where this is located is in the bladder and the ureters, for example. So it expands and contracts, right? So your bladder can go from being very small to when you have a lot of urine becoming very big. And so the lining of that, when it's really small, there's many layers. But as it expands, then it becomes fewer layers. And so that's an example of transitional epithelial tissue. Okay. We could also talk about the cell shape. So does anybody remember um, from cell biology, what would be the cell shape if it is flat? Squamous. So, so think, um, think squashed, right? So squamous means flat. We also have cuboidal, which means it's cube-shaped. So for example, in the kidney, the cells are cuboidal. The cells lining your sweat glands are cuboidal. And then we have columnar. So cells in the small intestine that are function in absorption are columnar. So we can put these together, these terms. And so we can say that uh, a um, tissue could be simple squamous epithelial tissue, for example. Simple, it means that it has a single layer. So it is not protective, right? So when we, wherever place where we need protection against um, viruses uh, or protection against friction, not viruses, like protection against friction, for example, um, would be stratified. 
So simple is not protective. So it means that it is a single layer of cells. So where might we see simple squamous epithelial tissue? Anybody know? So it's single flat shaped cells that look like this. Not in the skin because the skin, if it was simple, it would not be protective in the lungs, right? So for example, when we look at the lungs, oxygen can move through, right? So in the lungs, oxygen can move through that, that respiratory membrane in the lungs and CO2 can move out, okay? So this would be the respiratory membrane in the lungs. Another place where this actually is also located is in capillaries. So capillaries, we're gonna talk about this quarter, are super small blood vessels that tend to be leaky. So water tends to move through them and oxygen and carbon dioxide have to move through them, but also nutrients. So nutrients will move from the blood into the tissue fluid via the capillaries. Okay. So in your book, there are some pictures and you should be able to identify the pictures as being what type of tissue. Um, one of the things about the tissues that I forgot to mention, that I wanted to mention, but I forgot, is, is that um, the epithelial tissue is polar. So it has polarity, which means that we have a layer that always faces the internal or the external environment. And this is called the apical surface. Okay. So this faces the environment, right? So we have the apical surface on our skin, our outer epidermis, but if you think about our digestive tract or if you think about our esophagus, for example, there is um, the apical surface would be facing the space, which is called the lumen, okay? So the lumen, right, this is the space in the internal structures. Okay, the lumen. The other part of the polarity is, is that opposite the ap apical surface is the basal surface. And so the basal surface, right, this, can give rise to new cells and it is attached to connective tissue. The type of connective tissue that it is attached to has is the most abundant type of connective tissue in our body. So I'm just gonna give the name here. I'm not gonna talk about it yet, but it's called the areolar. CT, I'll put areolar connective tissue is what most epithelial is, tissue is connected to. So in terms of our skin, our skin contains cells at the base of the, of the epidermis that are constantly undergoing mitosis and then they migrate to the surface. And as they migrate, they pick up um, or they start to produce proteins called keratin and then they migrate to the apical surface where they then are sloughed off. Okay. So this is a diagram through the lungs and you can see that we have single layers of very flat cells. Now I wanted to show a little video here which talks about the regeneration of the tissues. And so let me get to find that. I'll probably find that the speakers aren't set up right. 
<laughs> Sorry, it's kind of funny. Kind of funny. Oh, I don't want to go up that high, probably. Well, that's kind of cool. It's telling me how high, how loud it is. Oh, come on. I muted it. Because if you think about how we're constantly being regenerated, all the physical Can you hear that? Shed and replenish, what actually remains? Good question, Lulu. <laughs> well, your hair obviously doesn't remain the same, and I'm not just talking about the style. Each hair on your head is replaced every two to seven years. A hundred hairs fall out every day and new ones grow back in their place. And look at your fingernails. They're completely new every six months or so. It turns out it's just a matter of time before almost every part of your body refreshes itself in a similar way. The lining of your stomach and intestines gets pretty beat up. It's constantly exposed to acid and fire. And so those cells get replaced every few days. Every few weeks, your outer layer of skin is completely renewed. Every four months, you have a fresh army of red blood cells. A hundred million new cells are born every minute, and a hundred million old cells are destroyed. It's actually the breakdown products of these red blood cells that turn your bruises and your urine yellow. Every ten years, you've got a new skeleton. A special team of cells breaks down old bone, and another builds new bone. Every fifteen years, your muscles are refreshed. You might think you gain and lose fat cells when you gain and lose weight, but they actually just get bigger and smaller. Over the course of 25 years, though, most of them turn off. But there are a few things that stick around for your entire life. About half of your heart stays with you from birth to death because those cells are replaced very slowly. Certain parts of your brain add a few new neurons over the course of your life. The vast majority of your neurons developed before you were born. It's the connections between those neurons, the circuits that store memories, that are constantly changing. And there's one more part of you that lasts your whole life. Months before you were born, a little cluster of cells stretched and filled themselves with transparent protein. As you grew, even after birth, more and more fibers were added. But that center endured. This is your lens, the window through which you are watching this video right now. And its core has remained the same since the moment you first opened your eyes. How old is your body really? Some of it is brand new. Some of it is as old as you are. Learn how scientists figured all this out. Check out our post at scumfear.tumblr.com and listen to Invisibilia. The latest episode is about whether or not personality persists throughout your entire life. If you have science questions, send them our way. Hey. Okay, so that's the idea that our tissues are constantly being regenerated. And remember, what type of cell division is that? Hmm? Mitosis, right? Mitosis is the regeneration of tissues. Okay, so we have simple squamous. Here is simple columnar. So here you can see that the column-shaped cells are located like this, right? And you can see that the nuclei are located here. One of the other structures that you see that we're gonna actually talk about um, soon would be the goblet cells. And the goblet cells actually produce mucus. This is the lining of the tubules in the kidney. And so this would be simple cuboidal, right? You can see the individual cube-shaped cells located here, and then the nucleus is stained a dark purple. This would be stratified squamous. And so 
this is the outer layer. This would be the apical surface, which is constantly being slept off. And then we can see the connective tissue underneath. And then we can see the basal membrane, which would be located near there. And that is what is going to, um, the cells are gonna reproduce there and then they essentially just migrate out. So somebody did a study where they were actually looking at common house dust that you have in your house. And they discovered that about 40% of it is actually just slept off skin cells, right? So you can't blame it all on the wheat fields when your house gets dusty, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is, and hair, right? Um, this is uh, the transitional epithelial tissue that is found in the ureters and in the bladder. Right? So this would be the kidneys right here. Those would be the ureters. And then this is the bladder. And so you'll notice here that um, some of the cells near the basement membrane are shaped more columnar and cuboidal. And then as you move up, they change shape. And so transitional epithelial tissue is designed to be able to expand and contract, as in the ureters and the bladder. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about today has to do with the glandular epithelial. <coughs> so when we look at glands, we can classify them into two different types. So all glands in our body are epithelial in nature. So when we look at um, the pancreas, for example, it is a gland but it actually has two different types of cells in it. So we have what are called exocrine glands. And exo means to the outside. And this means that they secrete their substances into ducts. So if we look at some examples of the exocrine gland, this would include salivary. This is sweat, right? This is sebaceous, which we're going to talk about when we get to the skin. Sebaceous glands um, are the reason that we get acne because they get clogged up with sebum, which has is kind of a lipid, lipid thing, but is actually also really important in lubricating the skin and keeping it from tearing. So the sebaceous glands, we also have mammary glands. So milk is secreted into ducts, okay? So those are some examples of glands. We also have part of the pancreas. So the pancreas has a gland that secretes enzymes. And so enzymes, those enzymes are transported from the pancreas to the small intestine where they help to break down our food, okay? So the pancreas is part exocrine, but it is also part endocrine. So I mentioned endocrine glands earlier today, and what did I say that they secreted? When I was talking about neuroendocrinology, for example. Hormones, okay? So these secrete specifically, they secrete hormones, and hormones are not transported via a duct. So these, har these hormones are secreted into the blood. And the blood is what transports it via the circulatory system to its target organ. So when we talk about um, we have hormones that are secreted by the pituitary gland, which is up near your brain, and they are um, go down to your gonads, which are your reproductive organs, and then they cause the development of egg and sperm, right? So um, some examples of the endocrine glands include the pancreas, and does anybody know what hormone the pancreas secretes? Insulin. So the pancreas is weird in that it has both an endocrine function and an exocrine function. But we also have the pituitary, oops, let me spell it right, 
pituitary. Okay. We have the thyroid. We have the gonads, which would be the ovaries and the testes, our endocrine glands. They are that because our, our ovaries produce estrogen and the testes produce testosterone. We also have adrenal glands. Okay. So where are the adrenal glands located? Does anybody know? What organ do they sit above? Kidneys. Kidneys, yes. And so the adrenal glands are also really interesting. We're gonna talk about the endocrine system next quarter, but they actually have a nervous part, which produces like epinephrine, and then the internal part is what produces the hormones. And so they can produce um, a stress hormone like cortisol, which causes um, a stress response in the body to prepare you for fight or flight. Okay, so the adrenal glands can produce stress hormones. Okay, so those would be examples of endocrine glands. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the endocrine glands, but we're gonna talk about the skin so we're probably gonna spend a little bit more time on exocrine glands this quarter. We also have examples of what are called unicellular glands. And these include what are called goblet cells. And they're called goblet cells because they're kind of shaped like a goblet. So they have kind of a, a, a large bowl and then a stem to them. And these specific cells secrete mucin. And mucin is a protein. And when mucin mixes with water, um, in the water outside of the cell, it produces mucus. And this is protective. So, our trachea, for example, produces mucus to capture substances that we breathe in. And then that mucus gets moved up through the use of cilia up towards our throat, and then we swallow the mucus. And then our stomach and um, uh, our um, other parts of our digestive tract secrete mucus in order to protect against acid and also microorganisms. So those are the goblet cells, okay. So then we also have multicellular glands, and they are classified as being tubular or areolar. Or not areolar, sorry, alveolar, uh, alveolar. Okay, so a tube would be like a straight, thing that looks like that. And then the cells that line this are gonna secrete substances. And so this would be like a gastric gland in your stomach that is going to produce enzymes and hydrochloric acid. So that's what a tubular gland looks like. And then the alveolar look more like this. They kind of branch and then they have these shapes that look like this. So they have these structures that look, um, when we start talking about the lungs, you'll know those as alveoli. So they have these, uh, has an increase in the surface area. Okay. So if we look at that goblet cell, oops, we have them here. Okay. So this is my goblet cell, right? Unicellular. You can see that it has a lot of rough ER because this is the organelle which produces it, uh, proteins that are going to be secreted. So you see all these secretory vesicles containing the mucin. And then if we look at the different shapes, right? These are the tubular. So you can see that um, gastric glands, intestinal glands, um, and you don't need to know the difference between simple and branched and compound. And then the alveolar glands, which one would include mammary. So you could put under mammary, or under the alveolar, you could put mammillary and salivary glands. Okay. So I am going to stop there. I'm sorry, I went a few minutes over.
And we'll continue. The next um, tissue that we're going to talk about is connective tissue. Change this. 